Welcome to the Mind and Matter Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Jacomis, and today I'm speaking with Dr. Tommaso Dejani. Tommaso is an assistant professor in the Departments of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and Radiology and Biomedical Imaging at the University of California, San Francisco, and his lab is studying uh, neuroscience. They use really interesting technology like ultrasound to modulate what the brain is doing and to actually image what's going on in the brain. So we talked about how some of that technology works in the context of experiments they're doing in rodents to look at how ketamine is actually working in the brain and what it's doing. So ultrasound. It's its the same technology that a pregnant woman is exposed to when she goes in and gets those images, those first images of her baby. So they actually use ultrasound to manipulate the brain and to see what's going on in the brain. And so we talked about some of the experiments they did using this technology in rats, looking at how ketamine influences different parts of the brain. So they're actually able to give ketamine to rats and obtain information about how proxies for brain activity are responding to ketamine. So they look at different parts of the brain from the prefrontal cortex to the nucleus accumbens and other regions. They look at how patterns of activity, in essence, are responding to ketamine, and they unveiled some interesting results. So they found uh, that there are sex-dependent effects of ketamine in the brain. In other words, male rats, the patterns that they see in their brain are different than what they see in female rats. Uh, They also uncovered some interesting results with respect to the opioid system. So some of ketamine's effects in the brain seem to involve the opioid system, and we talked about why that is and what they saw. Um, And interestingly, the involvement of the opioid system in some of ketamine's effects is itself sex dependent. So they see different uh, different levels of involvement of the opioid system in males versus females. And so we talked about some of that recent work that they've done and how that fits into the uh, larger field of ketamine research. We talked about what is known and still unknown about ketamine's mechanisms of action in the brain. We talked about some of the controversies in the field with respect to, you know, the extent to which ketamine is addictive or less addictive than other drugs, how exactly it's working in the brain to elicit its antidepressant effects, and how Tommaso's recent results tie into all of that. So if you're interested in ketamine and the brain, how it's working, and what's going on in terms of the latest findings, this is a really good episode. As always, don't forget to check out the links in the episode description. From there, you can get to the Mind and Matter substack at mindandmatter.substack.com to see all of my long-form science writing, which integrates and synthesizes a lot of the information across different episodes of the podcast. My free weekly newsletter is also there that tells you upcoming guests, new episodes, uh, interesting research that I'm reading that informs who comes on the show and other things that I'm looking at. You can also help the podcast by clicking on some of my affiliates. So I link to two or three different companies that I think make really cool products from at-home blood testing products to metabolic tracking technology uh, to nutrition. These are things that I have and I use myself. If you click those links, you will get a discount for those products and that helps the podcast a little bit. I get a little bit of that money, which I use to invest in new technology uh, and to travel to guests. I'm going to start doing that more to do in-person interviews and things like that. And your support there really helps. And with that, here's my conversation with Dr. Tommaso Deiani. Reaching out, I was um, actually listening to your podcast quite a bit when I was commuting to Stanford. So that was ah, which which cap, ones cap. did you listen to? Oh, I, las- I listened to Alex Kwan. Uh, I listened to Gould Dolan more recently. I listened to um, Christian Lusher. Oh yes, yes. I, I <laughs> I'm yeah. maybe going to ask you about uh, some of that work and how it connects. Yeah, yeah. I listened to yeah quite a, quite a few. Excellent. Yeah, no, I'm I'm glad to hear it. Sometimes uh, I'm starting to hear that more, which is which is a nice surprise. Yeah, yeah, that's nice. Yeah, yeah, because sometimes because you know when I first started, I, I was you know essentially emailing people and they have no idea who I am. But so- sometimes now they're like, oh yes, yes, I listened to this episode, so I already know you. Nice. Yeah. Um, do you want to just start off by uh, introducing yourself, telling people a little bit about your your scientific background and what your lab is doing now? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I am Tommaso Dianni. I uh, I'm an electrical and biomedical engineer by training, um, and then I did a postdoc at Stanford. I was in the department of radiology, but um, I was really working at the interface of um, ultrasound and neuroscience. So my background is uh, mostly in ultrasound, so both ultrasound imaging and uh, therapeutic ultrasound. 
And when during my postdoc at Stanford, um, I started applying these modalities to uh, to neuroscience. And uh, more recently, I started um, we started develop both developing and applying um, uh, kind of develop developing technological innovations and applying this modality called um, functional ultrasound imaging to studying. Um, pharmacology and studying how drugs act um, on the brain, and more specifically, ketamine, which is what we're going to talk about today. Hmm. Yeah, let's let's start off by talking about some of the technology here. So, you're using ultrasound to do imaging. Normally, when people hear ultrasound, they think about a pregnant woman going in for her ultrasound to uh, get those first images of the baby. Can you give us an overview of how exactly ultrasound technology works and what some of these other applications are beyond? Uh, beyond the familiar one yeah um so the imaging is really not much different than uh what happens um when when yeah the one of the applications the one you mentioned uh for fetal imaging but um what we are really looking at here is blood flows so ultrasound is also imaged um uh, so people may also be familiar with applications like color flow mapping, like when you're imaging um, an organ like the liver, for example, or the uh, the neonatal brain or um, the arteries, for example, in, in the neck. And you see those blue and red colors overlaid on the image. Those, are, those colors show um, a measure of blood flows. And so in, in the application that we are using that is again called functional ultrasound imaging, we are um, the kind of the underlying technique is called power Doppler. So we are doing Doppler imaging and imaging blood flows. Now, if we have one single image of the blood vasculature or like the, the blood flow, that's just giving us a snapshot of the vasculature at that specific time point. But what we do here, we track those blood flows over time. And there is a, um, a, a principle that is, the principle that is underlying all this is called neurovascular coupling, which is telling us that um, essentially the brain has no intrinsic ways to store energy and, and uh, oxygen. And therefore, if there is an increase in activity locally, the way these cells can get the supply of oxygen and glucose that they need is by recruiting more blood. Mm. So if we track those blood flows, we can indirectly infer mm. neural activity. So this I is see, not dissimilar to what happens with other modalities like fMRI, for example, functional magnetic resonance imaging. Yeah, so, so a chunk of neural tissue becomes more active. Um, it could be excitatory cells, it could be inhibitory cells, it could be both, but they're yeah. becoming more apt active, they require more energy to sustain that activity. So blood flow increases to that region to supply them with oxygen and nutrients and, and this and that. Um, so it's it's similar to fMRI in that way. In that sense, yes. We are looking in, in it's similar to fMRI in the way that we are looking at blood flows as an mm -hmm. indirect measure of neural activity. Yeah. Um, fMRI more specifically looks at the kind of the rate, it looks at oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin. Mm -hmm. While in this case, we're looking at cerebral blood volume, mm -hmm. but the two are highly correlated. And indeed, people have looked at both functional ultrasound imaging and fMRI uh, back to back with um, optogenetic stimuli, for example. Um, so like stimulating neural activity in a very uh, well controlled way and imaging with the, using the two modalities. And they what they saw is that um, functional ultrasound is indeed very highly correlated to uh, fMRI. So they are mm -hmm. giving us pretty much the same information, but functional ultrasound. The nice thing of functional ultrasound imaging is that uh, it is much more sensitive than mm -hmm. fMRI. So for studying um, these uh, these um, kind of like neural activity and how, for example, how the brain reacts or how the brain responds to, to drugs in animals, um, functional ultrasound imaging is um, g gives you a kind of a better better resolution and better effect sizes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so just for people listening, when we look at this data and we talk about it, you guys are measuring a proxy for neural activity, which has to do Correct. with blood flow, but you're not directly measuring the action potentials that the cells are sending out. That is correct. Yes, and um, so yes, exactly. There is that caveat that we are not uh, measuring spiking activity, 
but it's um, it's somewhere in between. So I, I like to, to mm -hmm. think of it as uh, kind of a translational tool in that whatever we find in animals, we can possibly translate into humans with fMRI, for example, or we can look at kind of uh, correlative measures in humans with fMRI because it's the underlying mechanism is very is very similar. So um, it's I think it's a nice bridge between the the animal world and the uh, um, the human world. Mm -hmm. And and you said something earlier about Doppler imaging. Is this have to do with the Doppler effect? Sort of, yes. I mean, um, the idea. So, kind of in the in the um, kind of at the origin of ultrasound blood flow imaging, there is the Doppler effect, um, and that's because kind of. So, so for the one for people listening, the Doppler effect is essentially that effect when kind of. An ambulance is approaching, and then you hear uh, the pitch is increasing. Uh, and then when the ambulance is kind of going away from you, you uh, you hear a lower pitch. So you have that, but the ambulance is emitting the same tone mm -hmm. all along. So that modulation that you uh, that you perceive um, is called the Doppler effect, which is essentially squeezing the pressure waves. When the ambulance is approaching, so you hear a, you hear a higher pitch, pitch, a pitch because the waves are closer together. And then when the ambulance is leaving, is dilating those pressure waves, and so you you hear a lower pitch. Similarly, when you send an ultrasound pulse and you have a scatterer moving away from you, it will modulate the ultrasound that you receive. And if it's moving towards you, it will so you will have a, either a, a higher or a lower frequency, and then mm -hmm. therefore by looking at those frequencies, you can um, you can kind of infer the velocity of the scatterer. Yeah, and let's um, let's just be really explicit for people. So when you use an ultrasound device, how exactly is it working to ultimately generate the the data that, that we're going to talk about? Um, so there is a lot happening in there. So I'm, I'm trying to kind of yeah squeezing in a lot you know as much information without as possible without uh, making it too confusing. So we are um, sending ultrasound pulses. And then uh, we are, so every time we send the pulse, then we start listening. Mm -hmm. So as that it's, pulse- It's, it's ultrasound. It's so ultrasound, are, are we yes. talking about a physical vibration that's generating it's a sound a, wave? It's exactly, it's a pressure wave that is not dissimilar to sound. The only mm -hmm. difference is that, uh, um, so we define ultrasound whatever is beyond twenty kilohertz because the uh, the spectrum of the uh, kind of the audible sound in humans is between twenty hertz and twenty kilohertz. Mm. Um, almost nobody can get to twenty kilohertz, but that's yeah, kind of yeah. like the textbook definition. Of the so ultrasound spectrum. is basically just referring to sound waves beyond what beyond, humans can exactly. possibly perceive. Exactly, and um, so in, in our case, we are looking at, we're talking about megahertz here. So um, the higher the, the frequency, the better the resolution. So we, we want to use a frequency as high as possible because then we get a better um, kind of a smaller pixel, a higher a spatial resolution. Um, but then, um, so essentially, yeah, we send up an ultrasound pulse, we listen. And then we use some smart array signal processing. So in, in the ultrasound probe, that is the one that is um, uh, that is in, in contact with, with the body, in contact with the brain in our case, or in contact with the uh, kind of with the skin in, in other, in all the other clinical applications. That's what we call an ultrasound probe. And the probe is um, Nowadays, it's almost never made of one single ultrasound transducer. So it's really made of an array of transducers. And so in the back end, so what happens in the scanner, we are detecting the, the pressure waves that are back scattered, that are returned, like scattered back by the tissue mm -hmm. from an array of sensors. And then we use some uh, signal processing to essentially refocus artificially, if you will, Mm -hmm. uh, so create electronic lenses. So we, so, so we we refocus in all the yeah. pixels in our image. So it sounds like there's an analogy between optical forms of imaging. So instead of using photons that go in and come back and they scatter with some kind of pattern, um, you're just doing this with sound. Uh, to some extent, yeah. I mean, some I guess you could, you could, yeah, you could think about it that way. Um, 
some some yeah i mean it is not we're, we're delivering some form of energy inside in this case is ultrasound uh in the other case it would be optical energy and then um you have something that it's yeah it has to be scattered uh, in in this case right because we are staying outside of the body so kind of we are sending something in and then listening or, or or watching from the same the same location so we are there is a backscattered component mm -hmm. um so yes i mean it's not it's not dissimilar the signal processing also kind of the array signal processing that I was talking about really comes from from radars, and um, it's not like in radars there there are these um, kind of antennas that are called phase arrays that are essentially moving the the electromagnetic beam uh, to scan a volume, and in this case we do something similar as well. So um, by having access to all those tiny ultrasound elements, we can manipulate the ultrasound that we send in because we can we have access and we can control each of those elements electronically so everything happens electronically we're not moving anything mechanically but then we can um manipulate the ultrasound very well and reconstruct the the images uh, out of the ultrasound signals that we receive from mm -hmm. all these tiny little transducers and uh last question on on this tech what kind of um can you say a little bit more about the the spatial and temporal resolution that you're actually getting? Yes. So as I mentioned, the uh, spatial resolution in particular is a function of the frequency. So the higher the frequency, the higher the spatial resolution. However, the attenuation is also a function of the frequency. So the higher the frequency, the higher attenuation we will um, have to, to face. And so um for applications that are relatively sh shallow we can use much higher frequencies because we can still penetrate um a few centimeters without losing too much of the of our kind of signal to noise ratio without losing too much energy um and so for example in our case we are using 15 megahertz in 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 all the our functional ultrasound imaging uh, studies and then Applications, for example, like in the liver, where you're imaging down to 15, 20 centimeters, those applications use much lower frequencies. And so that's uh, in kind of as a, the flip side of the coin is that you can penetrate deeper, but then you get a lower um, spatial resolution. I see. Um, just, yeah, one caveat actually that I wanted to mention, since we're talking about penetration depth compared to optics, is that the nice thing of ultrasound is that we can penetrate deep so we can in, in our case for example we can image the whole body yeah yeah so for those listening access. so when you use a microscope um to do like calcium imaging or something you can image the cerebral cortex you can go down you know a little bit in the brain um and collect photons back to create a, an image that way so what you're saying is you can go much deeper in the brain and get information about deeper structures exactly and Possibly we can get whole brain imaging or like going back to optics. The other thing that you could do, you can implant, for example, a fiber optic, the mm -hmm. technique that is called fiber photometry. Mm -hmm. And so you can detect photons from deep inside the brain, but then you are so one. You're also causing physical damage. though. Exactly. So, it's invasive. Yeah, no. And also you are biasing in the study in that you are de deciding a priori where you want to look at mm. while it, when you look at the whole brain, you you can survey the whole yeah, thing and then exactly, decide yeah, yeah exactly um last question actually one more um is there what is there any reason to believe that the ultrasound stimulus itself might affect neural activity that's a very good question so we ourselves like in our lab um we are we're working with ultrasound in neuroscience so we we work both on we, we develop technologies and we use ultrasound imaging, as well as another technique that is called ultrasound neuromodulation. So we are using ultrasound to modulate neural activity. Um, so we are actively kind of doing, doing that as well. And in that case, um, kind of, so the, the difference is that we need a higher level of um, intensity or a higher energy at the, um, you know, at the focus or or at whatever we want to in that case stimulate or inhibit neural activity 
um, it requires much higher intensity than what we use in imaging. Because in imaging, so to give you an idea, in one case, we are focusing the energy. So we are using those elements or a physical or, or an electronic lens to focus the ultrasound energy in one spot, even though the intensity is still much lower than what is called high intensity focused ultrasound, which is essentially ablating tissue. So we're not in that regimen of very high intensities, but still the intensity that we deliver for neuromodulation is a lot higher than what the, the intensity that we subject the tissue to in ultrasound imaging applications. Because in ultrasound imaging, we are using plane waves, and actually that goes back to the temporal resolution question, which I haven't really answered yet. But uh, we use plane waves, which means we are um, in sonify, we are sending ultrasound into the whole field of view at once. So we're not focusing the energy in any point. We are the energy is diluting in, in the tissue. It's, it's being see. diluted in the tissue. So the intensity at the um kind of in the tissue is is very minimal compared to what we would need to modulate neural activity. I see. So oh okay. So it's um in that way, it's different from something like two photon microscopy, where you're, you're focusing you're exactly. focusing all of your light yeah. in one plane. Yeah, exactly. So in the old days of ultrasound imaging, that's what happened. So you were you would focus the energy in one point and then either build kind of that kind of build up, meaning like in in post processing, right? I mean, you acquire the data and then you you build the image in that specific point where you image where you focus the energy or you build the line. So you kind of, you have a focus, you see have focusing in transmit and receive. So kind of, you can do all these different tricks. So basically you can, anyway, I mean, what I was, what I was saying, what I was trying to say is that in the old days of ultrasound imaging or in most clinical scanners still today, you are focusing the energy in one specific point or in a few point for each image line. Okay. While in our case, we are, sending the energy in the entire volume at once. And the advantage of that is that every time we send a pulse, instead of sending energy in one point and therefore imaging that one point or a line, we can image the whole volume. So we have a much higher temporal resolution in the order of, uh, in the order of kilohertz. Mm -hmm. Well, if we have to build an image point by point, by the time we've, we have built the whole image, uh, there, kind of we are already like the tissue has moved, everything has changed. So that, that kind of gives us a much lower temporal resolution that we would actually need to look at these tiny signals from the brain, the brain musculature. So using ultrasound, you can get information about what's going on in the brain. Um, you're getting a signal back, which has to do with blood flow, which is going to be related to what the neurons are doing in terms of their action potentials, but it's not literally a direct measure of that signal. Um, it's kind of similar to fMRI in that way, um, but we're using ultrasound, the same thing that a pregnant woman would, uh, uh, you know, when she goes in to get her ultrasound to see her baby, it's it's the same type of technology. You can point that at a little rodent's brain and actually uh, get information about pretty much all parts of the brain. And you guys used this technology recently to study the effects of ketamine in the brain. Um, because I've done so many episodes about ketamine and, and enough people listening will, will have some basic education here, I don't want to spend too much time on the basic basics of ketamine. Nonetheless, let's just, for, for those listening who aren't uh, very up to speed on what's going on in, in the ketamine research world, what is ketamine? What has it been used for historically? And what have we started to use it for more recently from a, a medical and therapeutic perspective? Um, yes. So ketamine... The textbook, textbook definition of ketamine is an NMDA receptor antagonist, uh, which means it is blocking these receptors in the brain that are called um, N-methyl D-aspartate receptors. And um, historically, ketamine was really used as a combat anesthetic in the beginning. So it, it is very safe compared to other anesthetics, uh, compared to narcotics, for example. It doesn't cause significant uh, side effects, so it can be used in on the battlefield, and um, so that's how kind of ketamine was used for um, historically for a very long time, and then um, 
in the early 2000s, it kind of it became clear or there, there started to be evidence that ketamine had antidepressant effects and at very low doses. So at a, a very sub-anesthetic, at sub-anesthetic doses, so a very tiny infusion of ketamine has um, antidepressant effects. And the nice thing is that those effects are um, very rapid. So it's a rapid acting antidepressant, if, mm, mm, uh, antidepressant, which is an advantage compared to, let's say, um, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors that take weeks to, to show effects. Um, so that's one advantage. However, the effects, the antidepressant effects are also short lasted. So mm. it starts acting within hours and then uh, usually the effect fades out between one and two weeks. I see. So um, immediate effect, rapid antidepressant effect, but not particularly particularly long lasting compared to other drugs. Right. Um, even things like psilocybin, for example, have a much different time course. Um, you mentioned that you get different effects at different doses. So just to s summarize that, at high doses, let's just call it high doses, um, you get anesthetic effects. That's been a historical use. Um, at lower doses, you get psychoactive effects. So when people are using ketamine recreationally, I guess we can just call that a medium dose. Yeah. And then the low doses that give the antidepressant effects, are they low enough where there's no obvious psychoactive effects either? Uh, no, there are there are definitely um, psychoactive effects. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it beyond, is, it I is guess dissociative, yeah. uh, okay, most, so you, mostly. So the antidepressant effects do happen concurrently with some dissociation. Um, yeah, I mean, the dissociation happens. So I believe the, um, the antidepressant effect outlast the dissociation. So the dissociation mm -hmm. is only limited to the half-life of the drug, um, kind of the, the, the time when the drug is actually actively uh, inside the body. And then the antidepressant effects outlast that, meaning that, as I mentioned, they last for one to two weeks. And at that point, ketamine will be mm -hmm. definitely out of the body. So it's not actively causing yeah. any, um, it's not binding to those receptors anymore yeah. because it's been, uh, it has washed out. Yeah, and, the antidepressant effects are still an antidepressant tr effect. Yeah, the antidepressant effects are triggered by the drug, but they outlast the drug. So something's happening Correct. that that uh, outlasts the drug being in the brain. Um, that actually sort of preempts my next question. So before we we go into your work, which is going to have interesting things to say about how ketamine is working, uh, you mentioned that that the primary mechanism that ketamine is known for is antagonizing the NMDA receptor in the brain. Is, has that been proven to be the mechanism that causes or is required for the antidepressant effects? Um, are other mechanisms thought to be at work you know, that are actually responsible for the antidepressant effects or that are also required in addition to the NMDA receptor effect? What's sort of the latest on what's known and what's controversial about the antidepressant mechanism? I think that's a, a very active question right now um, because there is no... I don't think there is definitely necessarily a consensus on the mechanism, definitely in humans, um, because again, the the original idea is that ketamine binds to the um, these NMDA receptors, um, preferentially in um, inhibitory interneurons in the prefrontal cortex, and therefore it is inhibiting inhibitory interneurons and uh, having an excitatory effect. Kind of a net excitatory effect but um there's been evidence recently um preclinical evidence showing that there are also other mechanisms that may be responsible for the mechanism of action of uh ketamine at least for the kind of the antidepressant like effects in in rodents uh for example on AMPA receptors, so it's another receptor that also um, is a glut glutamate receptor, but different than the NMDA receptors. Um, and then more recently, both in humans and in rodents, there's, there's been evidence that by blocking the opiate receptors, so a different type of receptors, um, the that seems to modulate the antidepressant effect as well. So. Now, how those are kind of placed in the pipeline, so where ketamine is binding first and what is happening downstream, 
at least to my knowledge, that is not very clear yet. So mm-hmm. we don't know exactly what's the cascade of events that is leading to the antidepressant effect downstream. I see. Um, you know, another way to start to think about this is, um, you know, there are many other drugs that antagonize the NMDA receptor. Some of them are probably much more specific for interacting with the NMDA okay. receptor. Um, do NMDA receptors antagonists generally have antidepressant effects or is ketamine somehow unique here? No, that's actually, that's one of the, exactly. Yeah. Thank you for, for that question. One of the reason why I believe people have started in the first place, they've started investigating other mechanisms for the antidepressant effect of ketamine is that more selective NMDA receptor antagonists didn't work very well in clinical trials. Uh, so they would still work maybe in animal models, but the animal models are models by definition. So um, kind of they don't, we can only model a very complex disorder like depression in animals, you know, we can only do that much to model that. So because it's a very complex disorder and therefore, um, anyway, those, those NMDA receptor antagonists didn't work very well in clinical trials. And therefore people started looking at alternative hypotheses for the mechanism of action of of ketamine. Mm -hmm. Um, is there any evidence that ketamine might be metabolized and one or more of its metabolites might be doing something relevant? Therefore, so definitely. So ketamine is metabolized into um, norketamine, hydroxynorketamine. So there are all these um, um, metabolites that are um, created, if you will, uh, mostly by the liver. And then they, uh, they're also psychoactive, so they reach the brain and they do something themselves. There is some evidence uh, that those metabolites are actually sufficient to create um, an antidepressant effect in animals, mm-hmm. but there is also evidence that is uh, going against that. So I don't think we have a clear picture yet if specifically hydroxynorketamine, if it is, at least to my knowledge, um, if that is sufficient to have an antidepressant effect. Yeah. So this is a very active field of research. It sounds like, you know, there's evidence for some of these things, but then there's also conflicting evidence. So, so we really are on the cutting edge here and, and no one truly knows exactly what's going on yet. Uh, That's correct. Yes. I think that's the, yeah. Um, one more background piece of information about ketamine that I think is interesting and relevant. So as uh, many people know, there's two ketamine isomers, S and R. What do we know about the differences between them? Do they have different pharmacological properties? Do they have different effects with respect to the antidepressive, antidepression effect or anything else? Uh, yes, definitely. So, um, so first off, maybe let's step back. So we have three compounds here. Right? We have really like three uh, when we talk about ketamine, we are talking really about three different things. One is S-ketamine and R-ketamine. So these are the two uh, stereoisomers. So it's the same molecule, but uh, specular uh, structure. And then the other one is racemic ketamine. So when usually when we talk about ketamine without specifying anything, we are talking about the racemic compound, which is more or less 50% R-ketamine and 50% S-ketamine. And what, for what we know, at least now, I think, yes, they are all acting differently and they bind to, they have different um, affinity for different receptors. Um, S-ketamine, for example, seems to have a higher affinity for opioid receptors than, or for mu and cup opioid receptors than, than R-ketamine, for example. Um, so they are definitely, they they act differently and um s ketamine is fda approved for treatment resistant depression um our ketamine there is it's an active field of research to to determine if our ketamine is um has antidepressant effects or not and the safety profile also seems to be different between the two at least in animals mm. um, so they are definitely different different molecules and they act differently yes um in the study that that you guys did recently that we're going to talk about did you use one isomer or was it the racemic ketamine um 
so we, we worked with both. So the, the study that uh, you are mentioning, the one that was um, published more recently, um, that's with only with racemic ketamine. And um, but we also collaborated with um, Mike Michalides at the National Institute on Drug Abuse at the NIH. And in that case, we used uh, S-ketamine. So we were imaging the effects of S-ketamine in the brain. And in the paper that came out recently, we were only looking at racemic ketamine. So it's, again, 50% of uh, our ketamine and 50% uh, of S-ketamine. Um, yeah, so let's let's talk about uh, the recent study a little bit. Can you just give us a basic overview? What, what was the setup and, and what kind of experimental, what kind of questions were you looking to answer? Yes, so... Our study really um, kind of the, the 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 way we came up with this uh, um, with this idea of testing uh, the opioid receptors, testing kind of what is happening in the brain um, at the opioid receptor level, um, was generated by um, a few a couple of papers that came up in between 2018 and 2019 that were showing then that in patients, so patients with treatment resistant depression, um, an, an opioid receptor antagonist called naltrexone was suppressing the antidepressant effect. So in these patients, they were retreating the patient with naltrexone before administering, administering um, subanesthetic ketamine. And in the other group, they were just administering ketamine. So they were pre-treating with saline, so kind of an inert compound. And the group in the group that they pre-treated with saline, so the group that just received ketamine, they saw, as expected, an antidepressant effect um, of subanesthetic ketamine. However, when they pre-treated the, the, the patients with naltrexone, they were suppressing that effect. So they were essentially deleting, at least partly, the antidepressant effect of ketamine. So, so the interpretation of that is that somehow the opioid system is involved. Yes, that's correct. Um, okay, so uh, what did you guys do in, in your paper with rodents? So in our rodents, we in, in our paper, we essentially tried to back translate, kind of reverse translate that into animals. Um, now, of course, we don't have depressed animals uh just as a as a caveat these are these are rats and so it's not a um um it's not a tiny human so we have it's a different animal altogether but um we tried to kind of reverse translate that study so we use the same compound that is not tracks on again to uh, uh, block the opioid receptors and then we administered Subanesthetic ketamine at a dose that is very is, is widely used in in the literature uh, and is known to elicit antidepressant effects in or antidepressant like effects in rodents. And then we imaged essentially what happens in the brain when we administer ketamine alone, or when we are blocking the opioid receptors before we administer ketamine. And so and the, the underlying idea is that if the op, if ketamine has kind of is not interacting with opioid receptors at all, then the two conditions should look um, the same. should look the same. Mm -hmm. But if a ketamine or if the opioid receptors are responsible to some extent that we don't know yet, if they are responsible for that effect, then when we block the opioid receptor, so when we take them essentially out of, of the picture, we silence them, then there is something different happening. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what we try to, um, to decode here. I see. So the question is basically, is the opioid system involved in ketamine's action in the brain? You have this ultrasound technique. You can, you can point your little ultrasound um, at the skull of a rat. You can get information about what's going on in the brain. I'm going to refer just for people listening to connect this with what we were saying earlier about how this technique works. I'm going to say things like brain activity, but you know you're not measuring spiking activity. You're, you're measuring a proxy for this, but it's related to the 
to how active the neurons are. So you're able to look at activity in different parts of the brain using this um, ultrasound technique. You can give ketamine, you can give ketamine and simultaneously block the opioid receptor. If that receptor system, if opioids are, are doing something, then we should see a difference between ketamine versus ketamine plus opioid block. Um, so where did you look in the brain? And then what did you see? Did you see a difference? Um, so we looked at um, to we kind of we limited our because we didn't have a, a fully volumetric imaging setup um, at the time. We looked at two slices in the brain, but we tried to pick slices where we knew from the literature that something interesting could happen. Um, so the in one slice we have the prefrontal cortex that is been um has been has been shown to be involved with the mechanism of action of ketamine broadly for different uh different models of disease and and also more mechanistically the prefrontal cortex seems to be very heavily involved with the mechanism of action yeah. of, of ketamine. I think it's 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 fair to say right that like the prefront certain circuits in the prefrontal cortex certain chunks of the brain in in that region um, seem to play an outsized role in depression, generally speaking, and awesome. in the the action of things like ketamine and and serotonergic psychedelics. That's correct. Yes, I mean it seems that exactly. Um, but honestly, all those regions that we are going to talk about, they are they were they're both um, interesting for both depression and ketamine, and mm -hmm. so kind of that that was interesting for us to see that that was actually the case. So the other region in that in that same slice is the nucleus accumbens, which is a region that is very important for um, reward processing. So also important for depression, for example, for um, the anhedonic aspects of depression. So kind of lack of lack of pleasure from, yeah, from yeah. rewarding stimuli. Um, so comments also again like a very very important region yeah and that's also like when we think about things like drug addiction or addiction generally um that's a kind of alteration of reward processing and the nucleus nucleus accumbens is a very important uh part of the brain circuits in there are very important um for addiction before we go further in your paper actually um can you give people a short summary of what do we know about ketamine's addictive potential relative to other drugs of abuse um, well, just for full disclosure, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I will just, yeah. So I don't, I don't, um, I, I don't see patients with either depression or addiction, but, um, I, I think in general, there is, the idea is that ketamine is not, uh, or the kind of the mainstream idea is that ketamine is not very addictive. Um, it is abused, so it is um, a substance that is, it is a controlled substance, um, so it's regulated by the um, um, Drug Enforcement Administration, and the reason is that it is, it is used recreationally, it is abused as a drug, but kind of the general consensus, at least to my understanding, is that it's not very addictive. Um, but again, this is something that is very much an object of research right now. And there, again, seems to be a difference also between the different molecules, like R-ketamine versus S-ketamine mm. versus racemic ketamine versus hydroxine or ketamine and so on. So yeah. we don't know exactly um, what, yeah. what is happening and we don't know exactly if it is addictive or not. Yeah, I mean, we don't have the mechanism of action fully worked out. That's part of what your paper's about. You've got R-ketamine, you've got S-ketamine. You know, sort of my my take on this, just for those listening, is on the one hand, you've got animal research from people like Christian Lusher, who I've had on, on the podcast before, if you want to go learn about that. And what they show fairly compellingly is that ketamine is certainly less addictive in a rodent than something like cocaine. Um, that doesn't mean it's not addictive at all. And it's also important to keep in mind, right? Uh, even though it's obvious, it's easy to forget um, a lot of times that you know rats and mice aren't humans, um, because even though that research in animals shows that se there seems to be quite a low addiction liability for ketamine, if you've spent any time around people who take ketamine recreationally, um, 
there are people out there who get addicted to ketamine for sure. So we kind of, yeah, we don't know exactly how addictive yet, but it's probably less addictive than something like cocaine, which is quite addictive. That's correct. Um, but then on that note, also work by um, Mike Michalidis, our collaborator at, at NIDA. Uh, NIDA is the National Institute on Drug Abuse. They have looked at um, R-ketamine versus S-ketamine. And also in the other paper that I mentioned, where we uh, looked at functional ultrasound imaging um, with S-ketamine in the Nucleus Accumbens again, um, they show that rats are self-administering S-ketamine, which means that mm. they are kind of self-administration is one of the um, is a, a behavioral model is a um, that is taught to recreate some of the aspects of uh, of addiction in in rodents, um, and rats do self-administer as ketamine, at least in in their hands, at least in, the, in their papers. I see. So there could there could be a difference between S and R, and there's exactly. some evidence that S is reinforcing in rodents, which would imply some addictive potential in humans. Exactly, exactly. And racemic ketamine again is made of both, so we also have that S ketamine component. Um, okay, so you looked at nucleus accumbens in your paper. You looked at parts of the uh, frontal cortex. Uh, what did you guys see? Uh, well, we also looked at a more posterior slice um, where we have some other interesting regions um, like the lateral abanula, for example, mm. which is a region that has been implicated heavily both with ketamine and with opioid receptors. It is also a region that is part of the reward circuit. It's not been studied um, a lot, definitely less than the prefrontal cortex and the nuclear accumbens, but what we know is that it is also Im implicated with the uh, reward circuitry in the brain. And um, in that slide, we also had the retrosplenial cortex, which is also another region that uh, uh, has been recently shown to, to be involved with the mechanism of action of, of uh, subanesthetic ketamine and specifically for the dissociative effects of mm. subanesthetic ketamine. Interesting. Um, all right. So you looked at several brain regions using this technique. Um, we've got the ketamine condition. We've got the ketamine plus blocking the opioid receptor condition. Um, what was the basic result that you saw? Um, so essentially we saw that when we are pretreating the animals with opioid receptors, um, it is modulating the um, neural activity evoked by its subanesthetic ketamine. So in some regions, it is um, suppressing, at least partially, that neural activation. In some other regions, it is enhancing um, the response to, to ketamine. So it, it appears to have divergent effects in different regions, which is also somewhat expected because some, some of these regions are acting differently, for example, in that reward circuit and in other circuits as well. Um, so that was expected, but there seems to be definitely um, an effect that is mediated by opioid receptors, because when we take them out of the picture, something is changing in the brain. Mm -hmm. However, something that was um, very, very surprising and unexpected to us was that this was only the case for male rats. Mm. When we um did these experiments in female rats we did not see any essentially any differences at least in these two slices that we looked at so there there seems to be a, a sex divergence in kind of this opioid mediated component in the uh, the response to to subanesthetic ketamine um what exactly was the difference between males and females uh well in males we saw all these different regions showing significant, statistically significant effects. In females, we almost did not see anything. So um, we almost, we saw some minor clusters of, of differences, but they were not, um, I see. So definitely, definitely they are not to the extent of what we see in, in males. I see. So in male rats, you give ketamine, it causes activity, it activity to change in a bunch of different parts of the brain. If you give them ketamine and simultaneously uh, block parts of the opioid system, you see 
big differences, significant differences in what's going on in the brain. So the opioid system is somehow involved in ketamine's effects. When you do that in females, the difference between the opioid block and non-opioid block condition uh, is much smaller. So there's less of an effect coming through the opioid system in females, it seems? If at all, yes. Um, there's, there are very minimal effects. We still see a response to ketamine itself. Mm -hmm. there, there are things that are slightly different than what we see in males, but still there is a substantial response to mm -hmm. ketamine itself. Just it doesn't change when we block the opioid receptors mm -hmm. in female rats. Did you guys go into the study intentionally um, aiming to look at males and females because there was some reason to believe there might be a sex difference? Or did you stumble onto this in the process it, of just studying the, the drug effect itself? Honestly, we stumbled on, on this. It was rather surprising that, um, it, that, that we saw such a strong sex difference. We only like when we did the... Um, the um, when we, we did a preliminary analysis of the data, like an, an interim analysis of the data that we had collected with about half the animals. Um, then we started seeing these very strong sex differences, and then it became so. So we had to essentially repeat the studies and have to to have um, to have a better statistical power in both yeah, yeah. males and females because then at that point yeah when you pull them all together the it would have diluted the effect you saw in males no we, we would still see significant effects even with males alone so male alone males alone were definitely driving statistically significant effects in the brain so when we pulled males and females we would still see effects but when mm. we specifically used statistical tests to um to to address that question mm -hmm. Which is pretty much a, almost these days a, it's a routine thing to, yeah, to do. Yeah. Like you pull, you use fifty percent males and fifty percent females, um, just as a as a caveat, as a historical background, males have been used uh, much more than than female animals in in research. It's only recently that people have started looking at um, kind of using both both sexes. But anyway, when we do that, at some point we run statistical tests. To see if there are sex differences, mm -hmm. and so when we did that, we uh, we had still a good good statistical power, so we we had significant effects. But then we saw um, this very strong difference between males and females, mm -hmm. uh, and so at that point we had to kind of repeat the experiments to 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 validate that and to verify that that was the case that indeed mm -hmm. only males were showing um, the, these opioid mediated effects. Yeah. Um, so earlier, you know, we were discussing, um, you know, whether or not or what the evidence is that ketamine might be addictive to some extent. Um, and we mentioned that, well, it's actually important to think about S versus R ketamine because there's some evidence to suggest one of them may ha might have uh, more reinforcing properties than the other. Um, is there the potential for a sex difference here? Um, in other words, does the involvement of the opioid system being stronger in males imply that they might have um, higher levels or potentially lower levels of, of addiction liability or, or reinforcement here? Um, again, this is just, uh, this is rats. So th there is quite a bit in between, you know, between what we show in rats and assessing the abuse liability in humans. Um, also, I don't think that we can necessarily see that the opiate system is stronger in males. That's not necessarily what we're seeing here. Um, it's just involved in it's some different. way. It's, yeah. it's involved in some way, and it's different between males and females. Mm -hmm. But I don't think we have evidence to say that, the, at least in our case, that the opioid receptor system is stronger in males. And indeed, I think there is evidence in the literature that it is quite the opposite, that um, females have a stronger, uh, or have kind of a, yeah, I mean, let's say stronger. It's, it's simplifying here, but uh, they have a stronger um, opioid receptor system. And also in our case, when we looked, now I'm jumping a little bit at the end of the paper with the, um, when we look, where we looked at um, opioid binding uh, of, of ketamine. Also there, we saw differences between males and females in the nucleus accumbens, but it doesn't mm. necessarily indicate that males have a stronger opioid system. Actually, our evidence seems to be going in the opposite direction that females are somewhat mm -hmm. overcompensating, not over, but compensating for that 
block mm-hmm. it than yeah. we do. So we block the but, receptors, but yeah. females but have the, more. Yeah, I guess. The, I guess the fact that you're seeing differences at all here. Um, both the sex difference and um, and with respect to the uh, opioid system, it's probably worth someone out there explicitly testing uh, the the level of uh, reinforcing properties you see in males versus females, and then probably breaking that up by by S versus R isomer. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, and yeah, I mean even even the the antidepressant effects, so without going in, in the direction of one of the reinforcing effects, but even just the antidepressant effects of, of sub-anesthetic ketamine, we, as, as um, relates to the opioid receptor system, we don't know exactly if there are any sex differences there because all the studies that have been done in humans, they are underpowered to, uh, which means they don't have enough, um, enough subjects to split them in two groups and and statistically compare mm. males versus females. Yep. yep. Um, so we don't have the statistical power to do those those assessments. As to um, for what relates to the opioid receptor system, not to yep. subanesthetic ketamine alone. Yep. Yep. Um, so you saw, I mean, ketamine is doing stuff in the brain. Uh, it's got this interesting um, sex dependent effect here. Um, the opioid system is involved, at least in males. Can you talk a little bit about uh, some of the experiments that you did to look at the the nature of how the brain activity changes? You did some ECOG experiments where you're looking at patterns of brain activity. So the ECOG experiments, they were... um, So as you mentioned earlier, we're looking at blood flows, right? So as a caveat here, we're not looking at neural activity, strictly speaking. We're looking at a proxy for neural activity. Um, so to to test or like to to address that that concern that actually what we're seeing is in, indicative of anything happening at the neural level as opposed to just something that happens in the cardiovascular system, we did experiments with electrocorticography. So we implanted electrodes um, on the surface of the brain and we recorded electrical signals um, in response to uh, sub-anesthetic ketamine. And then we correlated those signals with our functional ultrasound imaging um, responses. But that was with ketamine alone and without the opiate, uh, without blocking the opiate receptor. So it was more a way to validate that what we are measuring here, it is actually correlated to what happens at the neural level. Mm -hmm. And what we found was actually very interesting, um, also because it confirms what other people have seen as well. So functional ultrasound imaging is still a relatively new modality. So we're still, to some extent, trying to to really understand the the signals that we are uh, measuring, what's the underlying mechanism. But um, another group have looked at, um, they have looked at, kind of electrophysiological, uh, kind of doing a similar study, but in a different part of the brain and with different stimuli. And they saw a a correlation between the functional ultrasound imaging signal or the cerebral blood volume signal with um, uh, gamma power. So when we record these electrical signals from the brain, we split them into frequency bands, and then we can analyze those bands differently. And those bands give us different um, information. Mm -hmm. And so they, in that case, they observed a very strong correlation between the functional ultrasound signal and gamma band, gamma activity in, um, I believe it was the visual cortex and Mm -hmm. the hippocampus, but and with different stimuli. And in our case, we saw converging evidence that um, also functional ultrasound imaging was correlated to, um, very strongly correlated to the electrophysiological signal in the gamma band. I see. So, and when you say gamma band, so so basically, there's a lots of patterns of like electrical activity in the brain. Um, if by analogy we think about like looking at the surface of the ocean, right? You might have very fast little waves coming, uh, and you might have big slow waves from like a big ship going by. You guys can sort of measure how much of all of the different wavelengths there are in the signal, and you're saying that you see certain changes in certain bands. So so the gamma band would be relatively fast rhythms in the brain, right? That's correct. Yes. that's um, In our case, it was between 30 and 80 hertz. Everyone uses different kind of uh, 
limits for, for those bands, but it's usually between 20 and 30 and 50 to 80 hertz, mm -hmm. the, the upper band. Um, I, you know, I know that there's, you know, a lot of people have a lot of different opinions in the neuroscience world about what all of these rhythms and frequency bands mean, but just to give some people um, a, a sense for, for, for something a little bit more concrete here, what would be like, what would be like a naturalistic behavior? Like, do you see, do you see high gamma band activity in awake animals and sleeping animals and animals that are like doing a task and animals that are eating food? How do we think about high gamma band activity? Um, well, that, I mean, that's not really my field of study. So I, I kind of, yeah, that's just, you know, a, a big caveat there, but, um, but high gamma is mostly kind of indicative of, uh, uh, kind of an uh, um, awake and aroused response, so to speak. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I guess that would make sense. I mean, the doses of ketamine you're using here are, you know, by design, uh, not put in, they're not anesthetic. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so that, that's expected. Um, yeah. And also interestingly, there is, and again, this is a kind of, it will be object of further, further studies because I think it's something very exciting that, um, Kind of the 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 interneurons where ketamine binds at the NMDA receptors that we mentioned earlier is a, one of the hypotheses of subanesthetic ketamine. They are also involved with generating gamma oscillations in that part of the brain. So I think that was a, a very interesting kind of uh, point of contact between the two, which I thought was very very exciting. But we don't have evidence to to show to that those are, are related, but I just thought it was very interesting that uh, we did see those patterns converging between the two modalities in in, uh, in that part of the brain, which was the prefrontal cortex again. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, based on this study or, or other studies that are out there, um, when you give ketamine to a rodent, a freely um, behaving rodent, what are the behavioral effects? What are they, uh, a sub-anesthetic antidepressant dose? What do they, what do they do? How does their movement and their behavior change? Um, uh, they, I mean, there are different, different parents, uh, at least in rats. Um, they definitely become wobbly a little bit. I mean, they, they, they show kind of they, their behavior changes, their patterns of, um of behavior change change um in a way that they are kind of less in control like so to speak of of the of their of their environment and I'm just uh, anthropomorphizing the well, the 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 rat here but um they seem to be kind of less aware of, of what's what's happening around in in their environment um, there is a hyper locomotion uh, response, so they are actually it's moving around more. Moving around more, um, which is actually something that we also um, also tested, and that is also something that has been shown um, quite quite a bit in the literature that ketamine has a um, uh, causes hyper locomotion in in rodents. Um, so they are they are moving more, but kind of less able to move overall. They also sometimes show stereotypical responses, like they are maybe grooming more, or um, they can yeah do kind of different stereotypical behaviors. Mm -hmm. But it's usually short lasted. So within a few minutes, uh, it, they they are pretty much back to normal. So it is usually very see. very quick. Yeah, I see. Yeah, I would. Um... Yeah, and ketamine doesn't last that long. Like in humans, right? It lasts uh, for a shorter period of time than something like psilocybin, say. Um, and because of the the metabolic differences between rodents and humans, I imagine that the drug is basically in their system for just minutes, right? Yeah, it's very short. I mean, just also another thing that we should mention is that the dosage is, is very different uh, mm. between um, uh, humans and and rodents. Um, and that's again because of the di the differences at the metabolic level. The way the drug is metabolized in in the two animals um, is very different, and uh, rodents have a much faster metabolism. So usually we give uh, the the doses that we give in animals are much higher than what is actually used in humans. Mm -hmm. um, but those are kind of the doses that have been shown 
to have antidepressant-like effects in, in rodents. So there is a lot of literature showing that at that specific dose, um, you have you have antidepressant-like effects, which is 10 milligrams per kilo of, of body weight. Mm -hmm. So, so what are you guys doing to follow up on this or, or more broadly speaking, you know, what do you think are some of the next, uh, steps for the field to get a, uh, a better handle on, on ketamine's mechanism of action in the brain? Um, well, I think at the rodent level, one thing that we are actively, um, investigating right now is trying to understand better that circuit. So now we got these snapshots of regions in the brain where something interesting is happening when we block the opiate receptors but we don't know exactly how they relate to each other and we don't know exactly what is happening uh when these regions how these regions talk to each other is essentially and how those patterns change with and without the opiate receptors um we also there are some other regions in the brain um that are definitely interesting to look at that we left out in our study because also it was um, we had to kind of decide because of the setup that we had at the time. So now again, since we have access to kind of volumetric imaging, we're also expanding that. So there is a um, there's a paper. It's, a, it's actually a preprint that just came out a few weeks ago where they also show um, interesting effects in the central amygdala, uh, also with opioids and and ketamine. So that's also another region that uh, it could definitely be interesting to to look at. But in general, I mean, I'm interested in having this whole brain uh, picture of what's going on with and without opioid receptors. But um, that's all in in rodents. Um, and then in humans, it, it would be, I think it would be very nice to see if these um, kind of the effects that we found or this kind of ketamine opioid interaction um, and the sex differences translate into humans. So there, we don't have a whole lot of fMRI literature with ketamine. So it's something that we, we there's definitely some, um, but it's not um, not a lot, so we don't know exactly how those patterns may may change um, in in humans. But that I think would also be very interesting. Try to understand. Essentially, the question is if opioids, if opioid receptors are a thing at all, and if there are those strong sex differences, we need to try to understand if that is the case before deciding what to do with it essentially before kind of steering the 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 field in one direction or the other but i don't think we have a clear picture yet of what's happening um you know on the one hand you know obviously we 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 have seen that ketamine can have these remarkable rapid antidepressant effects they don't last forever they they are short term um on the other hand, you know, there's still a lot of open questions, um, right? There's there's still a lot of uh, controversy and, and and work to be done in the field to work out things like sex dependent effects, involvement of the opioid system, and, and the full mechanism of action to be worked out, um, and what exactly the addiction liability is. Is it different between SNR isomer? Is it different between males and females? So we've got you know we've got all of all of the science uh, that's still ongoing in terms of uh, how ketamine works and what it's doing. And on the other hand, you know, because of the remarkable results with respect to the rapid antidepressant effects, um, we've seen things like ketamine clinics just pop up all over the place. I see them all over now. Um, to what extent you know, is that warranted because we're seeing these rapid antidepressant effects and they are apparently helping a lot of people. People are commonly reporting that it does in fact help them when they get these doses. Um, and to what extent like, should we maybe be a little bit more cautious because we, while we are seeing these rapid antidepressant effects, we also know they don't last forever. And there may be, you know, there may be things we don't understand um, that should make us slow down a little bit. Yes. So on that note, I, I wanted to mention before answering your question that um, since ketamine has to be essentially um, administered over and over again, um, we also looked at repeated administration, kind of effects of repeated administration of ketamine. Ah. Um, because we kind of the rationale there was that we did see 
opioid receptors modulating the response to ketamine in that reward system. And so, and also knowing that ketamine needs to be administered in humans repeatedly, we wanted to try to see if the opioid receptors were also having an effect on, on kind of in, in that specific yeah. uh, behavioral response. Like if there was um, a habituation to the response exactly, or something like that. Exactly. And so we looked at uh, locomotor sensitization. So as I mentioned, rats or and mice, they, um, they have they show this hyper locomotion locomotion when they are administered ketamine, meaning that they behave more, they walk around more uh, acutely. So in, in the first twenty or twenty five minutes of ketamine administration uh, after ketamine administration, and as we administer the drug repeatedly, that response goes up. So the animals show some sort of adaptation um, in the um, in that part of the of the limbic system that uh is ramping up that that behavior um over several days of repeated drug administration so we um, we also try to probe that and again we saw that naltrexone blocked that um behavioral sensitization logomotor sensitization in males and in females we still had a behavioral sensitization meaning that the animals were um behaving more and more like um they had a locomotor this locomotor response was increasing more and more over um i don't remember if it was i don't recall if it was four or five days of repeated administration and but we could not block that with naltrexone so when we blocked the mm. opioid receptors in males we were essentially deleting almost completely that that behavioral sensitization while in females that was not the case I see. So, so again, there's a sex-dependent involvement of the opioid system here. What exactly is going on, we can't say. But behaviorally, the males were becoming more sensitive, sensitized, <laughs> sensitized um, to the effects of ketamine, at least with respect to locomotor behavior. Uh, no, they were both becoming sensitized to ketamine, both males and females. I see. But in males, we could block that effect by blocking the opioid receptors. But not in females. But not in females. So in females, whether the opioid receptors were available or not, they would become more sensitized to ketamine uh, regardless. But, but that was but, not the case in males. Got it. And so, you know, what, what would this potentially imply? That, you know, that potentially you could take uh, lower and lower doses of ketamine, and you would still get the same magnitude of effect. How how should we start to think about this? Um, I think it's more of a safety question. I mean, what you are, I, I think, taking a lower and lower dose of ketamine that would be more. Um, well, let, let me just a question that. of a efficacy, like yes. whether it is. Whether it, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. So, if there's sensitization. And let's say you know someone's going into a ketamine clinic and they have to go back every two weeks because the the antidepressant effects aren't permanent. Would this imply the possibility that you know if they're going back once every two weeks, they're actually becoming uh, they're effectively getting a larger dose because they're becoming more and more sensitive to the dose they're getting? Um, not necessarily. I mean that because there is also like a tolerance effect, which means they are. Kind of the um, the opioid receptors specifically, they are changing uh, in response to repeated administration, and that's actually something that we showed uh, both in this paper, but also in the other paper that I mentioned uh, with escadamine. We showed that the repeated administration of escadamine is reducing opioid receptor availability in the nucleus accumbens. Mm. So basically, when you lower the the, the level of, of the, the opioid receptors available. Essentially, you need more drug to get the same effect. The same level of reward. Exactly. So yeah. those are. It's not necessarily. Um, it's not necessarily like that. They're getting kind of a higher effect. Mm -hmm. I see. The logomotor okay. response is not. Yeah, it's it's not necessarily indicating that. I see, but you know, with repeated dosing. Um, there are differences. So it's not the exact same effect you're seeing with each successive dose. Exactly. There is a sensitization and there is a, a tolerance effect mechanism mm -hmm. that are uh, going on when you administer the drug repeatedly. Mm -hmm. So that, that would imply the likelihood that if 
repeated doses of ketamine are given, you know, time after time, the way the person or the animal responds um, is going to change over time potentially. Yeah, that's that's correct. And and it might like in the case of um, again, like with S ketamine, what we were probing there, and those were experiments that were done at NIDA. Again, we were, we did the functional ultrasound imaging experiments for that paper. Um, that is again like showing that it's, the animal is developing some sort of tolerance to the mm -hmm. drug, so it's reducing the sensitivity to to the drug because they, it has less opioid receptors um, to be activated. Mm -hmm. Um, so what are some of the, um, what are some of the experiments you guys think you're going to do in the near future? What are, what are some of the, the next steps and the next questions? Um, well, as I mentioned for us, we're very interested in trying to kind of go, um, deeper in understanding the circuit level effects, trying to understand how those regions talk to each other, um, and how that changes in response to the, uh, that opioid modulation. Um, that is definitely something that we are actively doing right now um, in the lab. There are also like another aspect of of this. Um, so the lab where I um, where I was before, where I did this work at Stanford, um, is developing ways to um, is developing technologies to deliver ketamine in a focus focal way. So kind of deliver ketamine only to a specific regions in the brain mm. uh also using ultrasound and therefore another aspect of this research is trying to understand if there are regions in the brain where we can preferentially elicit let's say now i'm, I'm you know stretching a little bit uh here but let's say that we can preferentially elicit an antidepressant that res response mm -hmm. versus other adverse yep. effects and yeah, therefore so if, if that is the case we can deliver ketamine yeah. only to that region specifically i see yeah so in principle you know the antidepressant effects might come largely from ketamine's effect on you know one part of the brain or one circuit maybe other effects come from other places if you could locally apply it there the idea would be you get the antidepressant effects without the other stuff that might be uh, undesirable that's correct and there have been, like in rodents people have um for example delivered ketamine like that you can micro infuse the drug in specific in regions in the brain. So people have shown definitely that ketamine in the prefrontal cortex uh, can have an antidepressant effect. People have shown that ketamine in the lateral abandula, this very tiny region where we also saw um, opiate dependent responses. So um, infusing ketamine only in that region also seems to be sufficient to elicit an antidepressant um, effect. So there are there there is there are indications that actually that may um, be sufficient, kind of that you can target regions individually and and still have an antidepressant effect. Now we don't know if that antidepressant effect is again mediated by the opioid receptors in that region, and if that would be necessarily safer uh that's an open that's an open question but that is another aspect of this kind of mapping that we're trying to do here interesting um well this is this is exciting stuff obviously this is a pretty hot field there's a lot going on um and it's pretty fast moving uh so it's it's exciting uh is there anything you want to reiterate for people or any final thoughts you want to leave them with about the specific work that you did or just this field in general uh just um again i think that we are like as basic scientists we are putting out evidence right that that something is happening then uh at, at least in rodents so um i think these are definitely a, um, effects that need to be confirmed in humans so hopefully there will be um clinical trials to specifically test these questions um because i think it is an, an important it is it's critical to to try to understand better these mechanisms to improve the safety profile of ketamine and if we have sex differences that have not been tested specifically so far um it will be critical to to try to understand those better and try to understand if that is actually a, a real in, in humans so mm -hmm. all right well professor tomaso de Yanni, thank you for your time thank you so much for having me
Hey everyone, I want to take a minute to tell you about a really cool health monitoring device I've been using for several weeks. It's called Lumen and it's a handheld pocket-sized device with a sleek design. It measures CO2 levels in your breath, which allows their technology to determine the extent to which your body is burning fats versus carbohydrates. Lumen helps improve your metabolic flexibility, your body's efficiency in shifting between using fats and carbs. It improves your ability to burn fat, which decreases your hunger levels and makes your body less dependent on snacking, and it can increase your energy levels by helping you develop a high-functioning metabolism. I use this device in the morning, before bed, and after meals and workouts to track my metabolism. With just a couple weeks of use, I learned a lot about which foods were causing my body to burn mostly fat, mostly carbs, or both, as well as how long I need to fast each day to promote fat burning. Lumen is great for anyone looking to optimize their health for either weight loss or athletic performance. The easy-to-use app allows you to track your results together with what you're eating and how you're exercising, and it syncs with other devices like the Apple Watch. Click the link in the episode description to learn more and use the code MIND, M-I-N-D, in all capital letters, to get $50 off your Lumen device today.